Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to all of you in the room and those journalists joining us online. We have with us today special rapporteur Finola Ni Aluoin, who I'm sure I mispronounced the last name and I apologize. The special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism. To her left is Ms. Adriana Edmades Jones, the senior legal advisor. Uh, the special rapporteur will make opening remarks and then she'll take your questions. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning. And um, I'm presenting actually my last report as Special Rapporteur. Um, and it was, uh, uh, was very pleased to be at, this, at the General Assembly this week. And I think before I start into the substance of my report, I actually do want to note that as Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, I present this report in the wake of appalling acts of terrorism all committed against civilians this month. On October 7th, 2023, um, the Sabbath and a religious holiday for Jews in the Mastung region of southern Balochistan, Pakistan, where attacks were directed at an Islamic uh, religious gathering, and in the Sahal, including in Mali and Burkina Faso, where we had sustained an ongoing terrorist attacks against civilians. I think it states the obvious to say that nothing, nothing, no creed, no cause justifies the use of indiscriminate violence, acts of terrorism against civilians, including hostage taking. And I unreservedly, as Special Rapporteur, condemn those acts. I also think that in the midst of everything that is going on in the Middle East and elsewhere, we have to continue to press for the rights of victims of terrorism. And when we do that, we have to offer more than solidarity and compassion. We have to protect those rights in international law most particularly when it's easy to have the rights of victims of terrorism drowned out. Um, and we have to hold those who commit acts against civilians, uh, acts of terrorism, uh, responsible, where those acts happen in the context of armed conflict for war crimes and for crimes of, against humanity, if those thresholds are, are met. And also, finally, it also states the obvious to say that when we act to prevent terrorism, we have to do that in full compliance with international human rights law, humanitarian law in particular, least we contribute to the conditions that produce, continue to produce and sustain acts of terrorism around the world. So this report has three parts, the reports I issued to the General Assembly. The first of those is the institutionalization or memorialization of a global study on the impact of counterterrorism on civil society and civic space. And that global study, I think, um, is an enormously important contribution to a global debate uh, about the misuse of counterterrorism systematically, structurally, and consistently in every region and almost every country without exception, global north and global south, against civil society. And I think what I wanted to stress in the study that the challenges of human rights violations in counterterrorism aren't abstract. Um, they're concrete, they're sustained, and they're increasingly multi-layered, they're cumulative, and they increasingly prevent civil society from doing their vital work in multiple places. And one of the things that's interesting is for decades, I think, like canaries in the coal mines, civil society actors and UN human rights mechanisms have been warning since 2001, since 9-11, about the challenge of the persistent misuse of counterterrorism and preventing and countering violent extremism measures. But I think for the most part, that narrative has remained at the margins of counterterrorism and security discourse. It's sort of dismissed as a bad apple phenomena. It's not something pervasive to the practice of countering terrorism globally. And I think there's been very little comprehensive data to, to really demonstrate that, in fact, counterterrorism is structurally wired uh, in ways that continue to perpetuate human rights abuses and violations against civil society. And so what this global study uh, found in the General Assembly report does is it documents restrictions in, across every reason, region, and it finds they're structurally related to the architecture that we put in place post 9-11. One of the things it finds, I think, is that for most civil society actors, these harms aren't singular. They're kind of multi-layered, um, they're, and they're multi-dimensional. They include not just countering terrorism finance measures that shut down organizations, human rights organizations, on spurious grounds often that they're associated with or promoting terrorism simply by doing human rights work. Um, but um, what we see is that once these counterterrorism measures are used against civil 
civil society actors, you kind of enter into a realm of exceptionality in domestic law. Counterterrorism law by its nature is exceptional. And that exceptional arena is actually where due process and procedural protections actually literally fade away and they create a host of vulnerabilities to other human rights violations. And um, the other thing I think my report does in a very concrete way is demonstrate how counterterrorism and preventing and countering terrorism uh, pre-CVE practice have a pervasive discriminatory aspect. And in particular, one of the things that this report does is show the multi-layered use of these kinds of measures against religious, ethnic, and cultural minorities, women, girls, LGBT and gender diverse persons, indigenous communities, and historically marginalized against groups in society. So securitization, security measures, counterterrorism, preventing and countering violence, extremism is actually layered in on top of existing structural discrimination against historically marginalized groups. Um, I think what's clear is that these have profound effects on civic space. We see just a massive sustained shutdown on civic space, the choking of civic space in so many countries, but also that these these, the sort of use of these kind of measures um, have direct consequences for both derogable and non-derogable rights. And the report is pretty clear that the UN itself, including its counterterrorism architecture, member states and regional organizations have a major task ahead of them and some very concrete things they, they have to do to address this which starts with not killing human rights defenders, which starts with actually naming and shaming states who consistently abuse counterterrorism, uh, and uh, calling that out for what it is, which is a fundamental, not just abuse of human rights, but actually lousy counterterrorism. Because if you're targeting civil society, you're generally targeting the best of us in society, and you're also, in fact, targeting those who are most likely to prevent terrorism in the first place. The second part of this report, which I want to speak to in my opening remarks, um, pertains to a technical visit that I conducted to Northeast Syria, the Northeast Syrian Arab Republic in July this year. I was the first uh, independent mandate holder to be given access to the places of detention, multiple places of detention in Northeast Syria, including al Hol, Al-Raj, um, Alaya, prison, Huri and uh, Orkesh uh, that are called rehabilitation centers for boys but are prisons for boys under the age of 18 and Panorama prison which is the high security prison uh, which some of you will remember was the subject of a, uh, an uh, ISIL outbreak uh, or attack uh, in January of last year. Um, so I acknowledge access to these, these places of detention was not easy, and both to the government um, and to the detaining authorities, um, I think the facilitation of letting an independent expert in is a really important step to opening up these places. But I do want to say that I, even as we accept and understand the complexity of the situation and the very complex conflict situation in Northeast Syria, and, and that includes acknowledging the scale of human rights violations committed by a designated terrorist group, Daesh, on the territory of Northeast Syria, um, uh, and the massive challenges being faced by the local population in terms of access to water, access to electricity, the scale of human rights violations that I found in those detention facilities should concern us all. I want to highlight egregious violations of the rights of the child in multiple closed camps, prisons, and detention facilities. Every single one. I, I would say that to use the word camp to describe any of these places is a misnomer. These are all places of detention which no one can leave from and which there is no process of law justifying detention. And all of these places are places where torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment is right. And I would just point out, and I think with so many events in other places in the world, I think it's easy to forget that you have over 70,000 people detained in these various places of detention in Northeast Syria, and the vast majority of that population is a child population. And this makes Northeast Syria the largest detention site for children on the grounds of terrorism anywhere in the world. 
And the report is absolutely crystal clear on the scale of violations being committed against children. And one of the populations I particularly want to highlight is um, the mass arbitrary separation of prepubescent and adolescent boys. And I met hundreds of these boys during my visit. Um, uh, what I can say to you is the thing that I observed most is the scale of trauma experienced by boys, some as young as nine, who have been forcibly separated from their mothers, leaving, I think, an enormous grief, trauma, and probably in many cases, irreparable harm. And I, this report is unequivocal that mass arbitrary separation of boys, which may constitute a core crime under international law, has to end. And I'm also really clear that the children in armed conflict agenda means nothing if it does not apply to the mass arbitrary separation and disappearance of children in northeast Syria. Um, the report is clear that the scale and extent of the practices against children in northeast Syria may constitute uh, the threshold for crimes against humanity under international law. And it is absolutely past urgent that member states repatriate their nationals from northeast Syria, because that is the only solution to the problem. Life cradle to grave detention of children who have had the misfortune to be born in a particular geography and to particular parents should simply not be tolerated by a civilized international community. And I call on the detaining authority to as a minimum adhere to common article three of the fourth of the four Geneva Conventions and to ensure that there is ongoing human rights oversight to every place of detention and every every category of detainee in the territory. I also wanted to make two further observations from my visit to northeast Syria. I was able to visit Al Hol, as I said, and I, although I was unable to access the Al Hol Annex, which is where third country national women are held, I was able to interview a sizable number of individuals. And I want to bring to your attention, to start with the fact that you have a prison within a prison, and it is third country national national women who are being held in, um, in conditions that again meet the threshold for torture, inhuman and degrading treatment, but also what my report's documents, I would say pretty meticulously, is enforced disappearances, incommunicado detention, coercive interrogation by security agents of multiple states. So access to that annex by multiple intelligence agencies of multiple countries to interrogate women and children. Security limiting medical care as well as physical and sexual violence and coercion for women and for girls. And just to state the obvious, if the women, peace, and security agenda means anything, it means that it should be applied and, and, um, and uh, enforced in northeast Syria. And none of what is happening in the third country and in the annex to Al Hol prison is acceptable. The final prison I want to highlight for you, documented in the report, is the extreme violations of human rights and humanitarian law I observed in Panorama Girwan prison. This is the prison that was the site of the ISIL breakout and the major um, uh, battle that took place in January of last year. The prison, um, based on the uh, numbers made available to me by the detaining authority, holds 5,000 men and 700 boys under the age of 18. Um, the detaining authority confirmed that tuberculosis is rife. My estimate is that 75% of that prison population has TB. There is no tuberculosis treatment in place in that prison. And if you follow the World Health Organization statistics, in 50% of cases where you have untreated TB, people die. The second observations in this report is while I was unable to interview men in that prison, I observed a large number of them. I was told that there was a problem with food provision in the prison. What I observed were emaciated men with protruding bones, characterized in my report as starving. <laughs> 
So when you put together the combination of a lack of access to medication, untreated TB, no separation of the sick from those who are not sick, 700 boys who are being held in a prison where starvation is rife and tuberculosis is widespread, then it looks like what you have is a tolerance for a de facto death sentence for everybody in that prison. I should point out that... Um, not a single detainee in that prison has been subject to any legal process, zero. And there's nothing in place that justifies their detention other than rhetoric about their alleged status, but no actual determination of law. What I found in the facility and observed firsthand was enforced disappearance and incommunicado detention as a regular practice. And I close my report by reminding all member states, including those who have a presence on the territory of the Northeast Syrian Arab Republic, that they too have human rights obligations to the detainee population, and that it is the obligation of every state to prevent and to remedy serious violations of international law, particularly those in lawyers speak that amount to violations of peremptory norms of international law. And I know our eyes are elsewhere. They're in other conflicts at this time. But the scale and egregiousness of human rights violations taking place in that territory will come back to haunt us all and will have serious security and human rights consequences if the eyes of the world are not firmly focused on the scale of harm occurring to children, men, and women in places of detention in Northeast Syria. So thank you. Happy to answer questions on the report and any other issues related to counterterrorism and human rights in the contemporary moment. Thank you very much, Special Rapporteur. Uh, I know we have a lot of questions. We'll start with AP. If I can just remind you all to please introduce yourselves. Um, Thank you very much. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondence Association for doing this briefing, this is a really devastating report. <clears throat> you started out talking about counterterrorism and counterterrorism um, measures. Um, we saw a terrorist attack on Israel, and now we are seeing counterterrorism um, measures by Israel in response. Um, can you tell us what you would tell the Israeli government if you had the opportunity about what those counterterrorism measures could and should not include. Mm -hmm. And um, when you said that, that there were over 70,000 detained in northern Syri Syria, did that include Al Hol or not? Because um, I think we understood that in Al Hol alone there were over 60,000, maybe near 70,000. Yeah. And I think I'll leave some of the other questions to my colleagues. No, thank you. Super. Thank you, Edie. Really nice to see you again. Um, so let me start by speaking to the terrorist attack, the acts of terrorism that took place on September, on October 7th. And I do want to say that it's really important that we acknowledge the scale and depth of the acts of terrorism that took place and their targeting of a civilian and Jewish population. They took place on the Sabbath, on a Jewish religious holiday, the end of Sukkot. And it's just to be clear, the essence of terrorism is to target civilians. And I think it's also very clear, as I and the Special Rapporteur on Summary and Arbitrary Executions um, uh, said publicly earlier this week, that we believe that the acts that took place on October 7th constitute gross violations of international law, particularly of international humanitarian law, and at a minimum constitute war crimes. They constitute crimes against humanity, and they, in particular, they constitute the crime of humanity of murder and and persecution of Jews as Jews. And that's really important that we do not lose sight of those acts. I would also be really clear that in relation to hostage taking, which is ongoing, that we have acts of perfidy, murder, and we know now over 200 people, largely, uh, again, women, 
children, in some cases babies, unaccompanied children, um, elderly individuals, and many of those people with serious health conditions being held by a, a number of groups. And it's really clear, no, what, no matter what grievance or scale of human right, rights violations have been committed, nothing justifies those acts. And the Special Rapporteur for Counterterrorism and Human Rights, I think we have to be crystal clear about the scale and the costs and the harms of those violations. But that brings us to counterterrorism, media, and your question is a good one. And I think we've also said very clearly what the obligation of Israel is in this regard. Uh, the governing framework of this conflict is international humanitarian law, and civilians have to be protected. That's the core rule. As the Secretary General said last week, wars have rules, and everyone is required to obey them. Um, children under international humanitarian law are deserving of special attention, and there are fundamental rules that schools and hospitals filled with children and <laughs> injured people cannot be targeted either by state or non-state actors. The rule holds true for both. And um, it's also clear that persons fleeing harm cannot be targeted. Um, and when we have breaches of those fundamental rules, we are also in the territory of war crimes. But uh, I guess I would also say, it's not just the party to the conflicts that have obligations here. Other states have obligations under Article I of the four Geneva Conventions to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. And that means those with influence over the non-state actor and those with influence over the state actor have an obligation under the laws of war to ensure that the rules are, expect are respected and remind those parties of their obligation to do so. Um, 70, to, to your second question, 70,000 70, includes Al Hall. So there's been a significant overall, re some reduction in numbers over the last couple of years. We've had large scale returns to Iraq. We've seen significant returns to countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. So we have seen a diminution of the population. But to be frank, it's a drop in the ocean based on the numbers that we still have there. And so the number that I include in this report is our best estimate based on our first-hand access to all of those places of detention, collating all the numbers that we could to reach that figure of 70,000. But it, yes, it does include Al Hol. Let's do Ephraim and then Kristen. To see you, Ms. Neoline. Thanks so much for this briefing. A quick follow-up on uh, your answer to Edie's question. Um, so, in your scholarly opinion, is um, what is going on now in Gaza, Israel's um, uh, strikes on Gaza, um, do, you, do you think it has the markings of an anti-terror campaign, as the Israelis are saying, the Israeli authorities, clearly? Mm. So as Special Rapporteur, I don't get to have academic opinions anymore, unfortunately. I only you get to have a special... You called the October 7 a terrorist attack, and yeah, it has no, that's all the my, markings. So yes, what so, about the territory strike? Yeah, you no, mentioned no. very clearly that it's war crimes territory when yeah. you attack hospitals, yeah. uh, fleeing uh, civilians. Yeah. Um, this is breaching of international... And we have yeah. seen that happen many, many times. So yeah. is this an anti-terror campaign? No, or? I think the framework is... we For, for obvious reasons, we hold state and non-state actors to different legal standards. We have 19 sectoral treaties on terrorism. We have multiple Security Council resolutions going back to 2001, UN Security Council Resolution 1373. I am unequivocal as Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, charged by states to implement and observe those standards, that the acts of October 7th were acts of terrorism. Um, but it is my view that every response to that is guided by international humanitarian law. That's the guiding framework. And when there's a breach of humanitarian law, then we're in the territory of war crimes. When you have grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, then you are in the territory of IHL and you're in the territory of a war crime. Yeah. But why is it clear that the October 7 attack is a terrorist attack, but what is happening later, you still can give your opinion about it? Who I am, I'm saying very clearly, you have a non-state armed group attacking civilians. If we say it is a terrorist attack on 9-11 to have a non-state armed group attack the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, 
and we say it's a terrorist attack to attack civilian worshippers in Balochistan, in Pakistan. It is equally a terrorist attack to harm civilians in their beds, their houses, their nurseries at a dance party. That is unequivocally a terrorist attack by any measure of international law. Hi, thanks. I'm Kristen Salumi from Al Jazeera English. Nice I'm wondering if you can reflect on what we learned from September 11th yeah. a little bit more and how it applies to the current situation in Israel-Gaza. Yeah, that's an excellent and very timely question. And so, you know, one of the things that I've spoken to you all about and documented for the last six years of my tenure is egregious breaches of human rights in the name of countering terrorism. And certainly if we look at the 9-11 attack, which again I have characterized not just as a, um, as, a, as a terrorist attack, but in my report on the Guantanamo Bay uh, facility, which I issued earlier this year, I also found that to constitute a crime against humanity under international law. But the other lesson from 9-11 is that even in response to an egregious act of violence, the, state is, the state's response is limited by law. And what did we learn after 9-11? Well, we learned that the state's response was um, mass rendition of Muslim men. We learned that the state's response was systemic um, torture. It, we learned that the state's response was the creation of a, of a legal uh, regime in the Guantanamo Bay facility that I have defined as a place defined by arbitrariness um, and which, as my report to the General Assembly affirms, continues to meet the standard of cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment under international law. So in many ways, what did we learn from 9-11? That the response was a, in deep and profound violation of international law. And the cost of that was the perpetuation of the cycle of conditions conducive to violence. It wasn't an end to violence. It provided the basis for further radicalization, further extremism conducive to terrorism. It provided um, a, a global nomenclature of a, quote, war on terror, which was not only profoundly ineffective in preventing terrorism, but actually spawned decades of serious and egregious violations of international law. So as Special Rapporteur, I would say, don't learn the lesson. Of, the lesson of 9-11 is don't do what was done after 9-11. Observe law, uphold the law. No matter how egregious an attack is, it is not a justification for the breach of international humanitarian law. And that's the lesson. Here And the object lesson, I, I, I wonder, is whether the lessons will be learned. And that's the challenge we're facing. And I think, as you've heard the Secretary General and others speak, is the call for law in this situation. And then Maggie. Thank you very much for this briefing, Yvonne Murray, RT News. Um, have you been able to approach the Israeli representation here with some of the points that you are making? Will you have the opportunity to do that? And what, how do you think your views might be received? I have a couple more questions, so mm -hmm. I just list them off now. Yeah, go ahead. So um, you, you also mentioned, which is kind of a follow-up to your answer just now to, to Kirsten, um, the scale, and, uh, the scale and the egregious nature of the human rights abuses in uh, the, the prisons that you visited in northeast Syria will come back to haunt us all, you said. Yeah. Can you just expand a little bit about what, what yeah. you mean in that? Uh, what yeah. kind of uh, you know, expectations do you have yeah. in that regard? Yeah. And then you said at the beginning that it's important, and I think you said this to the General Assembly, it's important to name and shame the states that are some of the, the worst yeah. abusers. Um, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, human rights abuses whilst countering terrorism. Mm. Can you name and shame? Can you, can you, you know, practice what you preach? <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
Sure, I'd be happy to try to get through all of that. So, I, I mean, my, my colleague and I, the Special Rapporteur on Summary and Arbitrary Execution, issued the statement we issued earlier last week. And actually, I don't think that the mark of a good statement is everybody's unhappy with you. <laughs> because on the one hand, it's very clear that it is not a popular sentiment these days to talk about the rights of victims of terrorism. And I unequivocally say that we have to do that. And we have to do that and not gloss over it, we, because the glossing over is in itself an egregious harm. And the recognition of the harm of terrorism to communities, to families, to societies, just like the city we live in, which was scarred and has been scarred for almost two decades by what happened on the events of 9-11. Communities don't forget those things, and societies don't forget those things. And the targeting of the most vulnerable is I think if we fail to understand the cost of that to a society and the deep psychological harm it does, the words we say to victims of terrorism are meaningless. These sort of shows of solidarity and compassion without the follow through of understanding what the harm is. And um, I also consistently claim that victims of terrorism have human rights, not just rights to sympathy. So I think there's a way in which the states who, who want to hear that message will hear it. But the corollary and equal balance to that is that the response has to be human rights and international law compliant. And so again, states may be unhappy with my insistence that the full letter, there is no blank check in counterterrorism. The rule of law applies the rules of international humanitarian law applied, and you don't get a pass because the harm was egregious to you. But I think an, an, you need both. You need an acknowledgement of a harm, a maintenance of the rules, and a recognition of the cost of counterterrorism, because the cost of counterterrorism is equally an egregious harm to those who are its innocent victims, caught up in the mainstream of those responses. So I guess my answer is that when you say both of those things simultaneously, and it seems to me as an international community, if we are not saying both of those two things consistently, and if we are, we have to stop the business of picking and choosing on who's in the Olympics of suffering in a way across the globe, whether it's in recent conflicts or older conflicts. That's in a way the meaning of implementing the rule of law, which is, which is in some ways going to keep everyone somewhat unhappy in, in, the midst of, in the midst of really grim and dark and unreceding violence. And that is what we see. Um, Yvonne, your question about Northeast Syria, I think, so, I mean, you know, it was quite, I would say my team and I were there in mid-July, the, it was 50 degree heat, so you're in a, in a facility, let's say Al, Al Hall as an example, where you have flimsy tents, you have thousands of children with like running around in the sand, nothing to do, literally nothing, lack of access to water structural violence around them, literally in the very kind of molecules of the, of the structures that they're living in, and actually no hope, as in th there's, there's no obvious way out. And the implication of that and why it haunts, it should haunt us all, is that you cannot keep almost 30,000 children incarcerated in these conditions without cost because those kids will grow up. And as someone who spent my life in human rights and counterterrorism, including in Northern Ireland, the ABC of repression is violence. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And so what are we looking at in the Northeast Syrian Arab Republic if we do not address the situation of these children? Is I would guarantee us that we are looking at another cycle of extreme and sustained violence just over the horizon. And that's why we should be, we should be worried about it pragmatically because actually the, the insecurity is literally just over the hill. But we should be profoundly worried when we use the language of counterterrorism to essentially um, stigmatize 30,000 kids and say, you, because you were born in this place, because your parents chose to the, this, come to this place, you will have no meaningful future, nothing. That your life is this. And that will inevitably breed violence. And we see it already in the camps. Um, 
So to name and shame states, I do so regularly, and actually the footnotes of my global study for those of you who have time to go perusing. But I'll give some very clear examples. Last year, the government of Nicaragua shut down 300 human rights organizations on the basis of countering terrorism finance. That is almost all of Nicaraguan civil society. Um, it's neither justified in my view, nor consistent with their obligations of international law, but it is a way, for example, to use the, to weaponize the language of counterterrorism. I've had the same thing to say about the, um, the limitations placed on Palestinian human rights organizations. Six Palestinian human rights organizations also defined al haq um, uh, the women's committees, the labor committees. These are people who do things like provide domestic violence shelters in, in the OP OPT. And again, when we delegitimize those who are in the active act of giving an outlet to harms, in, not just against the harms of, of the occupation, but also the violence being meted out by the Palestinian Authority in that same territory, um, that is a misuse of counterterrorism measures. I have spoken at length about countries, we see it in Mali, where um, we've seen the collapse of the democratic state, the weaponization of counterterrorism, and the use of mercenaries to advance a, quote, counterterrorism agenda. And again, the cost of that has been borne by civil society. So we don't have to go far. We see it, but, and the point, I think, of the report, which, and the, and the website that goes with it, which really documents the voices of civil society, is that the cost of targeting civil society will be felt in the lack of expression that people feel they have on the violence or inequities that daily life brings to them. And that's not good for any of us. Yeah. Thank you, Maggie. Hello, Special Rapporteur. I'm, I'm Margaret Bashir with Voice of America. Um, you were saying the lesson of the 9-11 response is don't repeat it. <laughs> so what legal response, in your opinion, is available to Israel now in, in light of the October 7th attacks? And uh, Israel issued an evacuation order to about a million people living in northern Gaza. Uh, the Palestinians are, they call it evacuation order. The Palestinians call it forced transfer. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that rise to the level of a war crime? And what about the complete siege on Gaza yeah. uh, about the aid? And could you do us broadcasters a favor and just pronounce your family name? Fanula Ni Eloin. That's a hard Irish name to pronounce. Um, so let me start from like what we don't, what, again, I just underscore like that there's to learn what we learned painfully from the events of 9-11 which was that the egregious and systematic violations of human rights most, I suppose, painfully seen in the rendition and torture and establishment of the uh, detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, was a fundamental mistake. And it was a mistake that has, I think, had long-term consequences for the United States, which is why when the US invited me to visit that detention facility this year, it was a turning point because it marked a commitment to the principle of access to places of detention and a first step on what I still view as a long journey of de-exceptionalizing the detention facility, remedying the harm to the hundreds of Muslim men who were transferred and resettled. And I note that there are still men who were settled, transferred, who live in penury, who don't have access to their medical records, who have never had torture rehabilitation, who've had no apology for what happened to them, and who've never had remedy or compensation for being rendered, transferred, tortured, and detained, many of them for almost two decades. So don't, learn, don't do that because that is a terrible object lesson in how not to respond to an egregious act of terrorism. Um, in terms of the situation in Gaza, here I would just simply echo and endorse the Secretary General's view, who's been crystal clear. The Secretary General has said that the evacuation order, which has been applied to, as you say, approximately 1.1 million people, and most of those people are children, will have devastating consequences. And I, along with him and many others in the UN system, condemn that siege, as well as being clear that the cutting off of water, uh, electricity, um, which indiscriminately 
and excessively harm civilians may constitute a war crime. So I think the Secretary, I, I and the Special Rapporteur on summary and arbitrary executions have been clear about that. Um, in terms of how do we pull states back from the brink and how, what, how do we do things better? It's a very, you know, I grew up in, in Ireland and spent much of my life in Belfast. And I would say the hardest thing to do is to stop, as we see right now, stop the cycle of violence. And, um, and those of us who are calling for things like ceasefires, recognizing the harm and the hurt on both sides. No one has a monopoly on pain. No one. And acknowledging the simple humanity of the other. And that's really hard. That requires gestures. It requires compassion. It requires empathy. It requires us to see the other as a human being. And all of us have an obligation to do that, every single one of us. And for the reporters who are reporting fairly on this, as you all are doing, um, who are seeking to represent all of that. And it's complex, it's messy. There isn't a simple, there isn't, there isn't either a simple solution or a simple representation. Um, but it does, at its most fundamental, require us to mutually recognize the harm of the harm we do to each other and the humanity of the other. And um, I think that's what some of us are trying to do and it is very difficult at this moment, yeah. Efren. Thanks again. Um, a question on um, the detention centers again. Yeah. When you speak to member states who have nationals in those camps, how do they justify uh, their reticence to repatriate and what's the conversation like and what do you tell them in return? That's a really good thing. question. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I've been crystal clear. Member states are failing to return. And actually, a number of those failing are prominent democracies who say they support human rights, that they defend the rights of the child. Some of them are even in the front row of the children in armed conflict agenda, but won't return their nationals home. And it's a double standard. And it's clear that everybody understands it as such and reads it as such. It's also a lack of um, recognition of mutual responsibilities, meaning nobody else is responsible for your citizens because you don't want them anymore. It's like discarding human beings as if they were surplus to need and kind of human debris, as it were. And we see a number of member states doing that. And so I've had very harsh conversations with member states, which is, you have a legal obligation to return these children. Some of you may be uh, in legal jeopardy because of your proximity to the non-state actor who is responsible for the detention facilities and proximity to the kinds of crimes that I think we are, I have said we are in the territory in, should be a wake-up call to num a number of member states whose nationals are in the camps. But the other thing I've stressed, I was in both Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan when they brought back large numbers of their nationals in the last couple of years. And the bottom line is repatriation is totally possible. And in many countries, it's working really well. And states are investing in the people that have been and returned back and demonstrating that it's possible to actually do this really well. Germany is another country that I visited this summer and saw firsthand not just return, but Germany's commitment to accountability for serious crimes that have happened in Northeast Syria. So th there's no soft landing for states on not bringing their nationals home. They are absolutely obliged, and those of them who speak in security terms have short-term vision. Because the security implications of non-return, I, I would bet, will be catastrophic just over the horizon because of the failure to deal with the here and now. Just a follow up on the countries in Northeast Syria. So we all know that the two countries that are there other than Syria itself are the United States and Turkey. Um, have you talked to the U.S. government and have you talked to the Turkish government? 
So there are actually four states, Edie. There's the United States, the Turkish government, the Russian government, oh. and the Iranians. There right. are four states. And having navigated checkpoints for a sizable portion of July, I can I attest about, to the I fact about, that they're all there. I forgot about the Russians. Yeah. So, uh, but well asked. And I would say, yes, my mandate has had discussions with all of them. We've also had discussions with, I came into and went out of the, the Syrian Arab Republic and Damascus, and we've had discussions with Damascus. And you'll obviously understand why some of those discussions I won't, I won't talk about in this regard, except to say that we've made clear to every single one of those states what their human rights and international humanitarian law obligations are. Um, and that all of those states have a collective responsibility to solving the crisis in Northeast Syria, and all of them have nationals in the camps. And, on, on, and some of those governments, I'll acknowledge that both the United States and the Russian Federation have made significant efforts to bring their own nationals home. But everyone has a long way to go. And again, our eyes are on other conflicts. And it's one of the dangers of the short-term cycle of thinking in security terms. But as I say, just over the horizon sits this problem again. Could I just ask you, do you have a breakdown then on how, how many US, Russian, Iranian, Turkish nationals are in those camps um, or estimate? So one of the challenges is that, um, and this is why the report finds that there are, um, there are, uh, there's incommunicado detention and enforced disappearances because the official position of the SDF is that they do not have numbers and they can't tell you who's in any of their prisons. And we start with that position as being wholly unacceptable in a place of detention. If you cannot tell, tell after this number of years, we're talking now almost since the fall of Baguz, uh, this population being unable to leave this facility and you cannot, you don't have a record of them, um, that, is, that is inconsistent with your obligations. But it's also not true because we are also aware that biometric data collection exercises have been carried out in all of these facilities by the detaining power. So I tend to believe they know exactly who they have in their, in their custody, more or less. A and this is one of the fundamental requests of my report, which is that actually the, the detaining power is under an obligation to identify and make known who's in its custody. Um, Country to country, it's difficult. For example, uh, you'll recall some weeks ago, um, I issued a public statement, and in fact, I think it was Charlie Savage at the New York Times who ran a piece on a US family where there's one remaining US family and a boy whom I met in Huri camp, a young, uh, a young boy who, uh, who had been taken from his mom um, and and his siblings hadn't talked to his mom in many, many months. Um, and talked about Drake, how much he loved Drake, Shakira, and hamburgers, and how he wanted to get home to his grandmother. So these children are not nameless, faceless um, monsters, as we portray them to be, but children caught up through no, no responsibility of their own in the most unimaginable situation. And I'm left with the extraordinary image of this child and many other boys that I met. But all over his, in his bedroom, he, has a, he had a bunk bed. They're in a kind of a facility where they have shared rooms and he has a bunk bed. And he, he has no picture of his mom, but he's drawn lots of pictures of her so he can remember what she looks like. And again, I go back to the fundamental capacity to move away from the dehumanization, including of children, and to treat children as children, and actually bring them home. All right, I don't see any questions. Um, before we wrap up, let me give you the opportunity if there's anything else that you'd like to say as a final statement. No, I'm good. Those were really excellent questions. And um, I, again, I, I would just stress the two thematic important things that come out of this report. One is the scale of abuse of counterterrorism globally. And it, again, 
today, given what's happening in hot conflict zones, people are not looking or thinking long term. But the long term misuse of counterterrorism and the evisceration of civil society, not just in old fashioned terms of killing and locking up, but in new fashioned technologies of surveillance and monitoring and, um, and online harassment, that if we lose the capacity of civil society to function in so many societies. We lose the capacity to do so much of the rule of law, human rights, dignitary work that's needed. And I, I would close by reminding states that the detention facilities in northeast of the Syrian Arab Republic must not be forgotten and that both the detaining power and states with influence have an obligation to address the scale, intensity, and duration of human rights violations and humanitarian law violations taking place there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Special Rapporteur. Thank you very much, Ms. Edmonds-Joyance. Thanks very much to all of you.